Right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us and being here with us tonight. By way of introduction for tonight um, and the wonderful Kate Washington, uh, my name is Patty Wilson and I'm the executive director for Hospice of Green Country, so welcome. And I thought, again, by way of introduction to Kate, I would tell you a little bit about my own caregiver story, just a, just a snippet, I promise, and um, really why Kate's book resonated with me. Um, just, you know, I've read it twice already. So um, I have to say, I remember the exact moment that I identified as a caregiver. At 26 years old, I had sold my parents' home and business, dispersed the assets to pay their bills, taken out a personal loan to cover the last payroll from their business at a frighteningly high interest rate, by the way, and was renting out my condo so that I could move in with my parents. In short, I was working but broke, a homeowner with no home, a sounding board for my mother, and a caregiver with my mother for my father who had had a stroke and ongoing health issues. I had tasks that identified me, but no identity. I was invisible even to myself. I remember the moment leaning against the Formica counter with boxes full of familiar family mementos in an unfamiliar, badly lit kitchen. There were so many people in my life, but I never felt more alone. It didn't happen fast. It was one dream put on hold or another small compromise to my independence. Other people's expectations of who I should be began to take over who I was and how I saw myself. When I read Kate's book, all those feelings, isolation, bitterness, and even anger that I had kept buried came back. So I guess they weren't buried so well. And I said, why? Why? I loved my parents. Now both gone, I would give anything, anything for more time with them. But that's the thing about feelings you try to hide and deny. They have a way of coming back. The first time I read Kate's book, Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in America, I identified with her struggles as a caregiver. The second time I read it, I identified with being a woman as a caregiver. When I was a caregiver, I did not believe that I was allowed to have bad feelings. Everyone thought I was so noble and wonderfully selfless, and I was happy to be there for my parents. But some days I felt many things that were anything but wonderful. Reading her book gave me permission where I had not given myself permission before to normalize what I felt and not berate myself for having some, shall we say, less than noble feelings. The book also gave me hope for a better way to support all caregivers. We can and should do better for us. In partnership with Majesty Books and through the generosity of our partners, the Tulsa Area United Way, the Anne and Henry Zero Foundation, uh, Magic City Books, Hospice Foundation of Oklahoma, Life Senior Services, Memorial Park Cemetery, and Jane Mudgett in honor of Ruth Richards. It is with great pleasure that Hospice of Green Country presents Kate Washington as we celebrate her book, Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in America, the story of one woman's struggle to care for her seriously ill husband and a revealing look at the role unpaid family caregivers play in a society that fails to provide them with structural support. Already Toast shows an all-consuming caregiving can be, how difficult it is to find support, and how the social and literary narratives that have long locked women into providing emotional labor also keep them unpaid caregivers roles. When Kate Washington and her husband Brad learned that he had cancer, they were young, a young couple, professionals with ascending careers, parents of two small children. Brad's diagnosis snapped those identities away. He became a patient and she his caregiver. She became so burned out that when she took an online quiz on caregiver self-care, her result clearly declared, you're already toast. As the baby boomer generation ages, the number of family caregivers will continue to grow. Readable, relatable, timely, and often uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> readable, relatable, and timely, and often already toast with its clear call for, for paying and supporting family caregivers is a crucial intervention in the conversation. 
bringing together personal experience with deep research to give voice to those tasks with the overlooked vital work of caring for the seriously ill. Kate Washington is an essayist and food writer who currently serves as the dining critic for the Sacramento, Sacramento Bee. Pardon me. Her work has appeared in many publications, including the Washington Post, Eater, Catapult, and McSweeney's Internet Tendency. Please join me in welcoming Kate Washington. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And I'd really like to thank Hospice of Green Country, Magic City Books, and all your partners for having me here tonight. Um, tonight, I really would like to speak with you about something that probably many in the audience already know quite a bit about firsthand, just as Patty described in her moving introduction and portrait of her own caring journey for her parents. And that is how caregiving can take over our lives, how difficult it can be to find relief, and a little bit about what I hope we all together can do about it. So I'll start seven years ago. At that time, I was not thinking about becoming a caregiver. I had thought maybe at some point I would care for my mom who lived in the city that I lived in, Sacramento, but she had passed away quite young. And so I didn't have a clear path to caregiving. I was thinking of caring for others, mainly in the context of my two children and being a parent. And as it happened, they were nine and five, seven years ago. And my five-year-old was starting kindergarten as five-year-olds do. And I was then a freelance writer as I am now. And I thought to myself, oh, this is great. I have made it. We made it to the elementary school years. I'm going to have time for me. I'm going to have time to write. I'm going to have time to start new, bigger, different projects. And I was literally sitting down at my little desk in the kitchen on her first day of kindergarten when my husband, Brad, came into the kitchen and he's always worn a beard. And so some, and he's a professor or he was a professor. And so sometimes he would kind of stroke it, but this time he was touching his jaw and he said to me, I've got these funny lumps on my jawline. Do you think I should see the doctor? And now I have to confess before he got sick, he was a little bit of a hypochondriac. And so I thought about those lumps, but I also thought about the fact that he'd lost 30 pounds over the preceding six to eight months. We'd been at a wedding that summer where a friend of mine had actually said like, Brad is so skinny, does he have cancer? And I was like, no, don't be silly. But that echoed in my mind when he said that about these lumps. And I looked him up and down. And I said, yeah, I think you should go to the doctor. I didn't know it, but that was my first act as a caregiver for him. I, of course, wasn't thinking of myself in a caring role toward my husband. He was 44. I was 42. He was a tenured professor at Sacramento State University. He lived his life independently, of course. He did not have strong medical needs. But that was the first moment that I entered into a caring relationship for him in terms of caring for him instead of just caring about him. And it was a slow slide into caregiving. I did not have that moment of epiphany of knowing exactly when I became a caregiver until much later. And I think that uncertain entry is really typical for a lot of caregivers. It's kind of one of the two ways we enter into a caregiving role. It's very typical in cases, say, of dementia or of a developing degenerative illness, a child with a parent who starts to notice memory lapses or that something's not right with mom or dad. And before you know it, you're kind of pulled into that caring relationship. In Brad's case, he went to the doctor and the doctor was like, well, we would be very surprised if it were anything serious. It's probably just, you know, nothing, a lipoma, a cyst, but we'll refer you out. We'll get it looked at if you really want. And every time we heard it would be very surprising, but we'll get it looked at. We said, yeah, we, we want it looked at, want to check it out. It took some pushing to get a biopsy took some time as I'm sure all of you in the audience know how the healthcare system can be. And eventually on Christmas Eve, we got the results of that biopsy. They were actually inconclusive. So we were right back where we started. We didn't know what was happening. 
It took another two months to get a conclusive biopsy result. So it, by that point, we were in February of 2015, and he was told that he had a very rare T-cell lymphoma. That's a kind of blood cancer so rare that it didn't even have a name, so rare that it didn't have a clear treatment protocol. And indeed, his oncologist said to us, you know, it might not ever even need to be treated. This may be an indolent, slow moving cancer. We may just need to watch and wait. And we said, you know, we wanna look into treatment. We didn't know, you know, exactly what was happening, but he, once we learned it was a lymphoma, we realized he did have some classic symptoms like night sweats, um, low energy, the weight loss, certainly. And so it was like, yeah, we, we wanna explore treatment options. So the doctor researched, he, he proposed a course of treatment. It was rejected by insurance. I still wasn't feeling like a caregiver, but I was going to every appointment. I was taking notes. I was calling the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. I was opening those explanations of benefits that we're, you know, we all know and love from insurance companies. And so I was engaging in a lot of the things that caregivers do. I was also, you know, serving as an advocate in meetings and we pursued having a second opinion. We went down to Stanford Medical Center to see what they had to say because they had a rare cancer, um, a rare lymphomas clinic. And that spring of 2015 wore on very uncertainly. We didn't really know what to do. We were kind of in limbo until one day when everything changed. And that was when I got a taste of the second way that people enter into caregiving, which is through a crisis. It was a May evening. We were sitting down to dinner. It, was, it had been like the first warm, really summer warm night of the spring. We'd taken the kids to the pool that day. It had been a great fun kind of like summer is coming, like school will be out soon. This is what a great day. We're sitting down to dinner, but everyone was a little tired. The girls were bickering. The food was getting cold. My husband wasn't coming to the table. And so I was getting a little annoyed as one does in those kind of life situations. And suddenly from the bathroom, Brad called out like, come here right now. And he's not really like a demander or a yeller. So that was surprising. And I was like, no, it's come to the table. Like I'm busy. And he's like, no, now. So I run into the bathroom to find that he is coughing up just enormous amounts of blood. It was terrifying. He was white as a sheet, clearly in distress, very worried about what was happening, which I immediately became equally worried. But I also went into a little bit of autopilot emergency management. I grabbed a bucket for him to cough into. I ran across our driveway, which we share with a neighbor and grab and banged on the door and asked my neighbor to come and sit with the girls while I took him to the hospital. I bundled him into the car and I ran every red light on the way to the hospital near our house where the cancer center he was being treated at was. I still don't know why I didn't call an ambulance, but I was really running on pure adrenaline, the adrenaline of a crisis, which I'm sure many of you are also familiar with. It turned out after some time and some challenges with getting further diagnosis in the hospital, that he, despite all the diagnostics that had been done, despite that second opinion, he had had a large lung tumor growing undetected in the lower corner of his lung right on a blood vessel. And what had happened was that it had ruptured and that's what caused the coughing. At that time, they said, this is not indolent at all. It's highly aggressive. It needs chemotherapy immediately. This, as you might imagine, was an incredibly stressful series of days. He got a PICC line inserted in his arm, which is a, an external catheter for um, giving chemotherapy. He needed chemotherapy really quickly. Unfortunately for him, he's like the worst person to get a blood cancer because he had a fear of needles and great squeamishness and was terrified of anyone discussing blood or veins in front of him. So getting consent for him to get that PICC line was its own caregiving challenge where I had to talk him through the entire procedure. 
this was the moment, this was the week when he was in the hospital for that first week, when I really got my first taste of what it meant to be somebody's primary caregiver. I was stretched between the hospital and home, trying to serve as an advocate while also trying desperately to figure out the intense Byzantine bureaucracy of a large teaching hospital, which is absolutely no joke to, to try to navigate. I was trying to comfort him while also dealing with my own intense fears about what the future might bring, trying to keep things a little bit normal for our girls while their dad was in the hospital. And while also the end of the school year with all its activities and needs for poster boards and projects to be brought in wore on. I remember one night desperately ordering a plastic lobster in the middle of the night for my daughter's um, she had a state floats parade. So we, we had borrowed a little red wagon and she was representing Massachusetts. And I had to get this plastic lobster so that she could be Massachusetts in the school parade. And in between that, being at the hospital, waiting to hear from doctors and trying to understand what was happening and what the future would bring. The chemotherapy that Brad got because his cancer was so aggressive and it advanced so quickly, it also responded very, dramatically to the chemotherapy. It shrank the tumor so rapidly that it actually created a hole in his lung, which then collapsed leading to intense infection risk. And he was a wreck. There were many days where he teetered on the brink of going into ICU. It was uncertain what was going to happen next. He ended up spending 17 days in the hospital, which at the time seemed like an immensely long time. It just seemed unbelievable. Previously, the longest hospitalization he'd had was one night for an appendix. When he was discharged, I was very surprised to learn that he needed IV antibiotics and that I was expected to administer them through his PICC line. And this is something I'll speak to a little bit more later, the high medical demands on family caregivers these days. It has really changed in recent decades, and it is a, an increasingly common and increasingly stressful part of being a family caregiver. I have no medical background, but I was acutely aware that that pick line snaked straight to his heart and that I could introduce bacteria or an air bubble at any time and threaten his life. And I received about half an hour of quick training in how to provide, provide this um, medical service to him at home. It was also an intense need that he had. It was, he needed these antibiotics, which took about mm, 10, 15 minutes to administer every eight hours. So that constrained me to home. And it was really scary. He came home, he had gone into the hospital seeming relatively well, even though we knew he had cancer. And he came home on oxygen, leaning on me, weakened just in the course of 17 days. It was a real shift and turning point in our family life and a real turning point in my self-conception. I had to drop a lot of the work that I was doing. I had to start thinking of myself as somebody who was an intermediary between him and the medical system, an advocate for him. And I often felt taken for granted and also overlooked by that medical system. You know, doctors were sometimes condescending, but they also at the same time assumed that I would simply be standing by to provide the care that he needed at home, to take care of everything, to be there at whatever time discharge was happening or whatever time the follow-up appointments they told me would be taking place. After that hospitalization, he transitioned to chemotherapy, which he had over the course of the summer. And he relapsed very, very quickly after that chemotherapy. At that point, his only option left was a stem cell transplant. Now, he was going to have a donor stem cell transplant. It turned out his brother was, um, was a donor match. So his brother had to come from Canada to donate stem cells. And for those who haven't experienced or known about a, a stem cell transplant, it sounds very technical, but it's incredibly brutal. 
It's also, of course, known as a bone marrow transplant. In it, the patient goes into the hospital, has chemotherapy, has radiation so intense that it brings the immune system down to absolute zero. The idea is to kill off the, the, exist, the patient's existing immune system and give stem cells that will graft and grow a new immune system that can more effectively fight any remaining cancer. Of course, the, the scorched earth chemotherapy and radiation also has the effect of killing off the cancer that is there, but sometimes it can come back and then the, immune, the new immune system is meant to fight that. This is incredibly hard on patients and was incredibly hard on Brad. He was optimistic going into his stem cell transplant in January of 2016. So this was a little over six months after his first hospitalization. I was more concerned, not sure that he would be out as soon as he thought he would be. And in, indeed, it turned out that I was unfortunately correct. He ended up staying in the hospital after that bone marrow transplant for four and a half months. First, he had complications related to the chemotherapy and the radiation, mouth sores so severe that he couldn't drink anything, including even a milkshake or sips of water. So he went on to um, IV nutrition. Other, you know, of course he lost his hair again. It had come back after chemotherapy. He had lost all of his energy. He was essentially bed bound um, and his immunity did go down to zero. He engrafted, which is the name for when the new, um, new immune system grows. And it seemed as though things were going better. And that's when the next round of really severe complications hit. He came down with something called graft versus host disease which is when the new immune system, the graft reacts against the patient, the host. It's sort of like the inverse of a solid organ transplant. If you can picture a, an immune system rejecting a, a new kidney or a donated organ, this is actually a new donated immune system that then rejects the host. And this can flare up in any part of the patient's body, guts, lungs, liver, skin rashes, it's very rare in the eyes, but Brad was always the one to get the rare things and always one to get the surprising things. And indeed we heard again at his bedside, well, we would be very surprised if this was graft versus host. His, his brother's donor cells were a perfect match. Well, everybody was surprised again. It was very severe graft versus host disease. He lost his vision, which they had never seen before on his unit. And his gut symptoms were so incredibly severe that I heard from his oncologist and transplant physician that his chances of survival were only 10%. You can imagine the strain of being bedside and seeing this, and I'll spare you some of the gorier details of his life in the hospital room. They're, they're in my book if you want to read the real nitty gritty. But I'm sure so many of you in the audience have had the experience of being in the hospital, helplessly watching a loved one suffer, unsure how to proceed, feeling torn between home and the hospital, but also incredibly stressed by the need to do things like bring socks, bring laundry. In Brad's case, he couldn't eat for weeks on end. And when he finally was learning to eat again, I was bringing him in broth from home to try to tempt him to relearn to eat. I was worried about our children who weren't able to see him for nearly three months because he was in an isolation room and he was so ill and he was far too ill and on too many medications to do something like FaceTime or even have a phone call with them. So the psychological strain on all of us was severe. I was really, really fortunate that my in-laws came and were with us and helped with both the girls and at the hospital. So I did have family support and there was a social worker available in the hospital, though the services available and offered were fairly minimal, I would say. You know, the, the social worker at the hospital was doing her best and provided me with some great resources for our kids, but less so for me. I think one of the 
challenges for caregivers is that, you know, if you want to find a support group or help, you know, from a peer group, it, you're just too busy. It's too hard to fit that in. And often people, if you're caring for somebody with a rare illness, you can't find something that fits with what you're, you're experiencing. And then there's just the strain of being at the hospital. I always would think about waiting, trying to get information, trying to have a moment to advocate for our needs and Brad's needs with the doctors and waiting for the doctors to round. They, this was a teaching hospital with big teams. And I swear to God, anytime you're waiting for the, for the doctors to come around, they inevitably come five minutes after you've waited for four, five, six hours, and you finally had to leave to use the bathroom, get a cup of coffee, or go pick up your school kids from the school aftercare that was about to close. They always come three minutes after that, and you miss them. But these are the experiences of having a loved one in the hospital. And after four and a half months of this, as you might imagine, I was pretty exhausted. And that's when it came time for Brad to come home and things actually got even more intense. As they were planning his discharge, the doctor looked at me and said, you know, he can't be left alone when he comes home even for a minute. And let me just say, I had pushed back against him being discharged. This was a man who was visually impaired, severely immunocompromised, unable to walk unassisted, incontinent and on IV nutrition for the majority of his caloric needs. I felt he needed much higher level care than I could provide at home. And now this doctor had looked at me and said, you need to have eyes on him 24 hours a day. And I just stopped in my tracks and I looked at him and I said, I can't, I can't do that. I mean, I have to take the kids to school there. I have to sleep. And he said, you know, usually family steps in and it works out fine. And that was such a galvanizing moment for me because I wanted to ask him, well, is your family available? Mine's already been here helping. They have to go home. And even between three adults, me, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, eight hour shifts round the clock all the time while caring for children and helping him with his medical needs and his 35 medications and all of the paperwork of having a very ill person and insurance and job paperwork and all of it on top of each other was too much. I'd already been a caregiver for a year, almost to the day at this point. I was already burned out and that almost pushed me over the edge. We were really fortunate. We had savings that we could dip into to pay home care workers, because the thing is that home care attendants, even if it's medically ordered as it was in Brad's case, is not covered by insurance. In some cases um, and in some states, Medicaid does provide that, does fill that gap and offer that kind of um, round the clock assistance for people but it's at a certain income level and those kind of benefits can be hard to access. We were so fortunate that we were able to afford that for the months that Brad needed that, but it did add certain kinds of strain to have, now I was an employer of people in my home trying to do right by them. And I'll speak a little bit later also about how home care workers are very vulnerable employees, um, often underpaid. We did the best we could by paying people directly, but it was, a, it was a challenging time. Brad had a complicated schedule of medications, huge number of medical appointments, rehab, all of the paperwork that I mentioned earlier. And plus I was caring for the kids, running the household and running all of our financial lives on top of everything else. I would say that I was probably devoting at least 40 hours a week to Brad's care. And then there was the rest of life and I wasn't working at all. And now I'm a freelance writer, so I could take all the time off that I wanted, but of course nobody pays a freelance writer who's not writing. It was a really challenging time and it led me to extreme levels of stress, 
feeling almost robotic as I went through my duties of caring for my husband. It really sapped me of a lot of empathy for him. I was so tired. I couldn't sleep. I was grinding my teeth. I got clumsy. I hurt my knee. I was burned out. I was at the end of my rope. And I think that's a, a feeling that so many caregivers share. And I think many people have come to share as the pandemic has worn on. And I'll speak more about the pandemic later. But I was like millions of other caregivers in America. My own story of caregiving is one of just 50, just one of more than 50 million. That's the number of people in America now caring for an adult family member or friend. Everyone here likely has a caregiving story, if not your own, of somebody in your family or of a friend that you know. As First Lady Rosalind Carter has memorably said, there are four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who will be care, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. I would say that sometimes each one of us can be all four of those things. They're not mutually exclusive. The broad impact of caregiving in America has been hidden for far too long. That 50 million figure includes one in six of us, more than that. And it doesn't include people who are caring for a high needs child or all the people who do not yet identify as caregivers, but who are doing caregiving tasks for a loved one, which is a considerable number. So who are the caregivers? I'm gonna break it down a little bit demographically and then go on to talk about um, some of the common themes among caregivers and some policy and other kinds of solutions. Our average age is 49, which happens to be the age I am now, and which I think suggests how many people are sandwich generation caregivers with multiple responsibilities. Kids at home, sometimes more than one parent, as Patty alluded to, um, sometimes more than one family member. So sandwich caregiving can go in a lot of different kinds of directions. Caregivers are about two thirds women. And women, I would like to point out, also do more hours as caregivers and tend to take on more intense caregiving and demanding caregiving tasks, such as bathing, toileting, assistance with uh, activities of daily living, hands-on medical care, that kind of thing. Not only does unpaid family caregiving have a higher impact on women, it also has a disproportionate impact on communities of color. The Black and Latinx communities have the highest prevalence of caregivers, and also in those communities, caregivers are on average assuming their duties much, much younger. But caregiving is being taken on by younger people across the board. It's in, the incidence is increasing in millennials and Gen X, and that's in part because the baby boomers are aging. Um, the oldest of the baby boomers reached 75 this year, and that speaks to the vast wave of elder care needs that we're going to see in the coming in the coming years, which many analysts are referring to as the coming care crisis or care gap. That means that family caregiving for so many could get even harder as people have multiple obligations and the obligations start earlier and earlier in people's lifespan. All of these 50 million stories and faces of caregiving are different, but I do wanna to speak to some common themes. One is constrained choice. Many people, like me, like many of you, I'm sure, enter into caregiving before they hardly even know that they're in it. A loved one gets sick, has a crisis, you're there, and suddenly you're the caregiver. It's not a moment of weighing options and thinking like, do I wish to take on caregiving duties for this person? And that's something, you know, it's a human desire to care for the people we love. It's essential to who we are as humans. I'm not arguing that we should all throw caregiving to the winds, but I am arguing that we need more structural and practical support to do it well when we're pulled into those caregiving relationships. Care has also become more intense, as I alluded to earlier. Many family caregivers are tasked with practical, um, with complex medical care at home. People are discharged with higher needs 
the kinds of things that would have been the province of a nurse to a generation or two ago are now being expected of, of family caregivers at home. Colostomy care, catheter care, wound care, um, shots, the IV administration that I spoke of earlier. My husband came home from his stem cell transplant needing IV nutrition administered nightly, and he had to be hooked up to a pump. And that was such an education for me, even beyond what I had done in um, administering his, um, his IV antibiotics. That pump took a good 20 minutes after to hook up after I got good at it. Every week, we got this enormous box of supplies, tubing, bags of bags of TPN, the nutrition uh, solution, vitamin solution that had to be injected with a, um, with a needle into the bag, a battery for every night of the pump. They even included a coin to open the little battery container. I was like, oh, well, I'm glad they thought of everything. I don't have to go looking for a quarter, but it was an intense procedure every night. And when he was being, when Brad was being discharged, a different transplant physician when I asked about this procedure and said like, this sounds really intense. She's like, oh, you just plug it in. A lot of our patients do it themselves. Now my husband who was blind had neuropathy and could not walk, could no more have just plugged that into a port in his chest than he could have gone out and run a marathon at that time. It wasn't the physician's job to support me at home or to set up arrangements to keep her patients safe once he was at home, but it really struck me that one of the things was that it was nobody's job. Her out of touch advice dismissing the importance of quality home care stayed with me in part because it was so clear the medical system simply assumed there would be someone there to take care of things at home. But this, as I alluded to in regards to ch constrained choice, is something that many families simply never sign up for or aren't capable of offering. This is, to be clear, a way that the medical system and the health insurance system shift costs and cut costs, but they shift them on to families. Families are taking these on, people are losing jobs, they're unable to work in order to prov provide quality care for their loved ones. So many families are faced with an impossible choice between being there to care for people who need their hands-on medical care and attendance and going to work to earn the money to support that family member and to maintain the insurance that that family member needs. These choices are impossible. And that leads me to another common theme, which is huge economic strain on families. There's an incredibly high rate of caregivers leaving the workforce. Female caregivers on average lose $324,000 a year or a, over a lifetime, not a year, <laughs> excuse me, as caregivers in part that, that includes uh, lost retirement savings. There are also huge opportunity costs when people have to step out of the workforce. We're one of the very few countries, of course, without paid family leave to enable people to do this. And I'll speak more about that later. So 70% of caregivers reduce their work hours. Female caregivers are more than two and a half times more likely to live in poverty than non-caregivers. And I would also add that these economic effects fall even more disproportionately on caregivers of color who are less likely to have the wealth and resources to withstand these kind of economic strains. Not surprisingly, all of this leads to another uh, common theme that I spoke to earlier, which is stress and health issues and mental health issues that all add up to burnout. I'd like to just mention here also that adding to the burdens on family caregivers is also the pain of grief and loss at the end of life. And this is something I really want to honor the work that Hospice of Green Country does to provide wraparound care to families and caregivers at end of life. Because so many people end a long journey of caregiving with all of the mixed and painful emotion that it brings with grief and loss afterwards. And the kind of grief support and support for people at the end of life that 
hospice organizations offer is critical to helping uh, caregivers transition back to health and a full sense of themselves after their caregiving journey is done. So many people have mixed feelings, negative feelings, as Patty alluded to in her intro introduction, that they don't feel good about and that increase, like people have shame and, and a lot of pain around those emotions. I was really fortunate that Brad survived, that even though he lives with disability and chronic illness, he is much more independent now and is able to manage a lot of elements of his own care. So I consider myself maybe more of a care partner, but the lingering emotions, the impact on our marriage and on our family life really remain and are tough. I wanna turn now to talk a little bit about the pandemic and some of the strains and opportunities that it brings to caregivers. The pandemic obviously brought caregiving to the forefront of national attention, though a lot of what I have seen about it has focused on the care of children and family caregiving once again stays a little bit in the background. In part, the pandemic has made the work of family caregivers far more difficult. We haven't been able to go into the nursing homes, into the hospitals, provide advocacy, be the partner and the support that our loved ones need. But at the same time, I think the pandemic provides us with an immense opportunity and one that we really need to attend to. I noticed recently a family member had surgery and his wife texted me a picture of her badge at the hospital. She was given a badge that read caregiver. Suddenly she had an official status. She was part of the care team. And that respect and acknowledgement is a small thing, but a critical first step to making sure that caregivers have a role at, on the care team that is as respected as their role is critical. The, lacks, the lack of caregiving and the ability of people to get into the hospital during the pandemic and the strains on the healthcare system, all of the challenges that we've seen nationwide during this time, and also often the need for other conditions to delay care, delay preventive care, all of those things, I think do create this opportunity for bringing caregiving to the forefront of the national agenda, which is really where it is now. As I've told my story, I didn't want to just talk about how burned out I was, how much I cried, how stressed I was. I really wanna talk about the systemic reasons for the challenges and some of the solutions that we might be able to see in the future. The United States has this strong ethos of individualism and self-reliance that really can work against us when it comes to caring for each other. Challenges of something like caregiving tend to stay behind closed doors unless they're exposed by something like a global pandemic. It can be hard for people to ask for help. We've all, or I at least have been there when somebody says, how are you? And just say, I'm fine to move past it, even if you're very much not fine. We also have a strong patriarchal tradition of relying on women instead of a social safety net, as the sociologist Jessica Clarko recently and memorably said. We often lack policy supports that would make caregiving more sustainable and more bearable, and community supports can be hard to access. So let me turn to solutions. The first and the biggest that I want to talk about is paid family leave. We're the only, I believe, industrialized nation that lacks this for people. People should not be having to leave work because they can't care for their loved ones, but it happens to millions of people every year. Paid family leave is on the docket before Congress right now. It's a policy that's being debated and it's a critical one to help caregivers move through the crisis with their loved ones. If these are issues that you care about, you can, you can call and advocate for that. And paid, 
family leave isn't just good for caregivers, it's good for businesses who can attract and retain valuable talent. Another critical policy shift would be to increase training and wages for paid care workers who are critical in respite and in providing relief to family, uh, family caregivers. I've spoken mostly about unpaid family caregivers, but paid care workers are an important element of the care that we all need in a more caring society. If we dream even bigger, we could think about direct pay or tax credits for family caregivers that would be good for families, care recipients, and caregivers alike. We need a more proactive culture around family caregiving. So many of us never really think about or expect to become family caregivers, better training, better looking ahead, more options for understanding what the caregiving role entails would help all of us. We need more funding for nonprofits and community supports like what Hospice of Green Country and its partners are doing every day. One challenge is that services are often siloed so that funding flows to, um, to particular ailments or conditions that people have um, for their loved ones. So it can be hard for caregivers to access a full range of options. There's often also a burden on caregivers to research and find services for themselves just at the time they're so stressed that they can hardly think straight. On a broader note, we all need also to think differently about the culture of care. Caregiving is something often done in private behind closed doors. It was for me and my family. The pandemic has brought it into greater light. I urge you all, if you're a caregiver, be transparent about what you need, ask for the real help that you need and not the help you think you ought to accept. If you're a friend or a community member of a caregiver, and I assure you, you are, even if you don't know it, proactively offer help send a text saying you're thinking of them, offer to run for groceries or drop off dinner. Today, I'd like to leave you all with this. It will always be difficult to have a loved one who is ailing, but it doesn't have to be this hard. Humans are all born needing care. Most of us die needing it and all of us need care along the way. Caring for each other is what makes us human. We don't need to abandon stressed, burned out spouses, adult children and parents with a hand wave and the assurance that, oh, it'll probably be fine. For millions of caregivers, it is absolutely not working out fine. We need a revolution in how we care for each other and caregivers are more than 50 million strong. If we raise our voices together, we can attain the caring society we all deserve. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions, have a further conversation. All right, uh, this is Christy Gibbs, everybody, your education coordinator for Hospice of Green Country, and I am pulling up Q&A right now. Uh, now that Kate is finished, I know it's a lot to take in. Her story um, is it's an intense journey and uh, many of you have had similar stories. Um, caregiving is one of those things where there are always a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. So now that you've had time to digest, please utilize that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I believe uh, our host with Magic City Books, Pat, is gonna be popping in with any questions from Facebook as well. Um, with that, let's start out with this question. Uh, in the book, you talk about how your background in literature uh, that you received your degree in, particularly fictional literature, showed you yourself as a caregiver in uh, characters that, um, that you uh, maybe didn't pay attention to um, whenever you first read the book. Um, can you speak about how our, our uh, our portrayals in pop culture make caregivers smaller and less visible and how you think that impacts those who identify as caregivers? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, that Yeah, that's an element of the book that I didn't really speak about today, but I do have a background in um, Victorian literature in particular. And when I went back to some old favorite books, I noticed caregivers that I'd overlooked kind of in the shadows of the plots, but they, they were kind of everywhere. And I think that's really common that the caregiving story 
is often a quieter one. It's not highlighted in um, in many popular culture, you know, depictions. There are some interesting movies out now, and I touch on them a little bit in the book. Um, one that I thought was really interesting in the past few years was The Farewell, um, but from, I believe, Lulu Wang was the director um, that tells kind of a caregiving story in that takes place in China. Um, I think, you know, we, st we tend to see a lot of representations of the self-sacrificing caregiver. There are not so many of the complexities of the relationship and the challenges of it. And one of the things that I wanted to do in my book was bring to light a little bit more of the complex kind of subjectivity, inner life of caregiving and not so much the outer expectation of self-sacrifice and just of caring and being a hero and people telling you, you know, like you're doing great and you've got this and you've got to stay positive. I wanted to look at all of the complex and messy and challenging, but really human and natural and understandable emotions that come with the real life of caring for somebody. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, I loved that aspect of the book personally. I thought that that really- um, Me too. Yeah, it just reinforced um, and was a great metaphor for um, how you felt as a caregiver in those characters. Um, next question here, uh, when in the depths of despair as a caregiver, um, do you have any suggestions for the audience or um, just personal stories about how you found the strength to carry on? Oh, gosh. I mean, I remember talking to a friend who went through a really intense caregiving journey as well. And I asked her how she'd done it. And she said, well, I had a lack of any other reasonable options, which I actually used as a as a um, header in the book. Like I, I borrowed that phrasing. I think some of it, a lot of how I felt found strength to go on was knowing that like my girls would continue to need me. Um, that was a huge motivator. Um, it can be really tough, you know, taking, taking the time away, um, finding respite care if you can, so that you can recharge even that little bit, you know, in the, in the book and in, as I talk and think about, uh, caregiving in general, I'm always wary of recommending, you know, more self-care because I think that can feel like more of a to-do list for caregivers than it often did for me where you can get support and relief, you know, and an outlet for your honest feelings about what you're going through. I think those are invaluable connections and things to be, you know, savored and, and guarded really closely, but, you know, whatever, whatever it takes to, to keep going, I think, you know, whatever motivation you can find, but it's, it's not easy. Absolutely. That'll be a little different for everybody, I think. And, mm -hmm. and you communicated that. Um, this question is uh, from someone who works in healthcare, And it's a great question. It says, I am a healthcare provider. Outside of being recognized as part of your husband's care team, what is one thing you wish the medical providers would have done better to make your transition from wife to caregiver easier? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I think the recognition and res and treatment with respect, I often felt a little bit condescended to, which was something I was personally felt kind of allergic to. But I think also, you know, more information, more transparency and clarity about, you know, what was happening. And I, you know, I, healthcare providers are really in a bind here too, because of course the system is really difficult. People are overstrapped. The patient loads are too high. You know, it's it's a difficult life journey to be a healthcare provider, and I'm really grateful for all the people who take it on, especially over the past you know 18 plus months. Um, you know, I think. One thing that I, you know, would love all care providers to keep in mind is that their day at the office 
is the worst day of somebody's life that they're interacting with. I mean, not in all healthcare settings, of course, but like in a crisis setting. And sometimes I felt that, that people were, were overlooking that and how strained I was and Brad was. So that's not one thing, it's a bunch, but. <laughs> Lots of options are good. Um, we all know the healthcare system uh, can get really overwhelmed and we've all been taught that by the pandemic for sure. Um, this person asks, what were the most meaningful ways that you were supported by others who weren't directly involved in helping you provide care that you would recommend to others? Uh, well, you know, I mentioned my in-laws and the help that they provided us by coming they, they're in Canada, so they had to like come internationally to help. That was incredible. Um, something that a local parent friend did, um, parents who are still friends with today. And in fact, my daughter just, I believe left for soccer practice and this guy is the coach. This one family said to us, just bring Lucy every Sunday at nine no questions asked, like when Brad was hospitalized and in the most intense phase of his illness. And they looked after her, they were the parents of her best friend and they had three kids and they added another one to the mix and we did not have to ask for that help. It was just offered in a way that was like so incredibly supportive and that we could just count on. And I know that's not something that everyone can offer, but it was, it meant so much to me. Um, you know, we, we also got meals, which are a classic and amazing for a reason. We had, we, we did have a lot of really amazing community support, but I think some of those like offers where people just said like, this is a lack and I'm going to fill it were amazing where I didn't have to actually think of like, what can you do? <laughs> how can I, how can, uh, how can you help me? When people told me how they could help me, it was amazing. Yeah, I can imagine that would be such a relief just not to have to have on that task, you know, okay, now I have to come up with something for you to do too. <laughs> yes. It's just one more thing to think about, right? Exactly. I don't know. I'm doing everything. So what can I tell you to do? Oh no. <laughs> for sure. Well, this person has a more of a comment. Um, I feel guilty leaving just long enough to get a haircut or a manicure. Can you relate to that or speak to that feeling? Oh, I can absolutely relate to that. It's so hard. Um, and I think we are all, you know, so many of us are socialized to feel that guilt. And it's, it's really tough when you're in an intense caregiving situation. But I would say that it's more important than ever when you can do so safely to make the time for yourself and just keep that little space open. Um, you know, and I, I know that's not easy and it's kind of easy for me to say from, from sitting here at my desk um, and not knowing the realities that people are, are going through, but I do feel that keeping, you know, feel the guilt and work through it and try to keep that space open for yourself anyway, but I very much identify with it. I bet a lot of people who are listening can identify with that too. I think that anybody who feels that way is really far from alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This next person uh, shares a little bit of their story with us. My parents are 90 and things are failing. They still live alone, but my siblings and I are splitting time with them. I keep thinking I will move there, work remotely when possible and live with them to be the main caregiver, but that's not really my personality, although I can do it. Is that crazy? And I know Kate, you and Patty both spoke to the self-sacrifice of doing things like that. So mm -hmm. I'll let you go ahead and speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think this comment and you know, my heart goes out to you and your family. Um, this comment really illustrates the pull of like, you know, when our parents start to fail, when loved ones are ill, we do, we want to help them. And honestly, like I'm not really a fully natural caregiver either. 
um, I would struggle with giving up my life and moving back to, you know, a parent's home to, to do that. I think, you know, this, this commenter mentioned having siblings who are taking turns. And if that can work, that's such a great way to do it and keep any one member of the family from feeling that, like, that it's all on them and feeling that um, stress that might eventually turn to resentment or, um, you know, conflict within the family. I've seen some really interesting models for, you know, sharing caregiving duties. And, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of spreadsheets or an app to divide up the labor. But I think if you can share the family across or share the duties across family or across a community, that is such a wonderful gift to give your family and yourself into the future. Um, obviously it's not always possible, but it's a tough, tough and very individual choice. It can though really bring your family closer together um, in, in a way that maybe you, it's very different in a very different way. Um, and I know, um, at least for my family, my brother and I, um, our plan, um, as my parents aged and then my mother also became ill, um, really brought us a lot closer together. I think, um, my brother, um, my sister-in-law and I are such a solid unit now. And I would have said before, oh, we love each other, but now it's just a different relationship. We, sh we have such a shared um, history, you know, in, in being able to provide that um, caregiving. Yeah, I, and I think that's so, you know, so meaningful and so wonderful in terms of, you know, caregiving can really cause rifts within families. And it's so wonderful to hear of times when like, it brings a lot of gifts and brings love and is a time for people to come together and support their loved ones. And part of what, you know, part of the reason I wanted to talk in the, my book and in the talks I do about the systemic factors that are making caregiving more difficult is that the experience that you're describing is how it should be able to be, but the strains of caregiving, the, the ways it's not supported often by our culture or by different kinds of policies make it so hard on families that it's hard to get to the good place of being able to offer support and see it as a thing that we want to do and a gift we want to give our loved ones and a shared endeavor with family that we can be close to. And I know, of course, not every, that's not every family story and never will be, but um, when it can be, that's, that's the ideal. I know it is 803 participants, but we have three more really great questions here. So hang with us um, for these. Uh, this person is possibly a sandwich caregiver and they would like to know about how your children fared during Brad's illness and uh, how you were able to care for them and support them as they were continuing to, to grow and, and deal with the devastating, you know, loss of your husband's health while he went through treatment. Oh yeah, thank you so much for for asking that question. And it is, it's not easy if if that is the situation that this this person is going through as a caregiver to balance the needs of children. Because I was always really aware that you know my kids were only getting one childhood, um, but that this was you know happening and could not wait either. Um, I felt really fortunate in the ages that my children were, um, you know, I spoke about my daughter starting kindergarten and the irony of that for my, my work life, but they were both in elementary school. We were not in like the intense baby and toddler years and we were not in like the surly teenage years either. So they were nine and five, um, 10 and six, you know, in that age range throughout Brad's illness. Um, I did get them um, into therapeutic relationships so that they had counseling and some additional support. Um, there's a wonderful art therapy group here in Sacramento offered for free through one of the hospital 
systems and I had them in that as well. And then um, I'll just mention one resource that has been really important for our family called Camp Kesem. That's a network of free summer camps um, for kids affected by a parent's cancer. And so that camp actually offered them like, you know, a week of fun and of just being a kid away from like the grim sadness of of home. And that camp was really important. I also, especially when Brad was hospitalized um, and his parents were here and able to be visiting him and supporting him in the hospital, I took the kids on um, little trips where I could, visited, you know, fun places, tried to maintain a sense of fun that was outside of the house, um, which was really important for me to get that mental separation and kept the kind of joy of parenting them alive for me. It was a real respite and a treat for me and I hope also for them, but they have, you know, positive memories of some of those, some of those trips that we took. Um, you know, I noticed that they matured through his illness. You know, I would never, you would never wish that for your children, but overall, I think they've, they've coped pretty well. And we were just so fortunate that I was able to connect them with different kinds of services and supports. I'm so glad to hear that your children are doing well. And thank you for sharing that with our audience. Um, two more questions for you. Uh, this one comes from someone who works with a volunteer base, and they would like to know um, how you see volunteers being utilized, uh, like a hospice volunteer, for example, mm -hmm. to provide relief to a primary caregiver. I think that is so wonderful when that can take place. I think there, you know, there has to be a relationship of trust and so that the caregiver can can count on that and know that that's going to be safe for their for their loved one it's not something that i was accessing just because i wasn't in a hospice situation so i don't actually have personal experience with it but i'm like it's so wonderful to know that organizations are providing that because i think those you know respite care and that's another thing that like made it tough i've talked to a few organizations that provide that that had to stop that service during the pandemic and it was so sad and painful for everybody involved but i think um you know all of the community supports and community um you know help that we can marshal is great um and i think you know that relationship of trust and consistency and, and the caregiver knowing that they can count on somebody is is really critical. But you know, if it's through an organization, that's something that they can then can foster. Uh, respite care is one of the big things we provide at Hospice of Green mm -hmm. Country. And we're really thankful um, that you know we've been able to go back to providing some of that this year in the midst of COVID-19. So final question, and uh, this one is uh, is one of my favorite questions that have happened during this session today. Um, it hits on my favorite topic whenever it comes to uh, caregiving and the things that a little self-care for a caregiver just can't fix, and that is uh, policy change and advocacy. So in terms of adv advocacy, are there any groups that you recommend following on social media or otherwise to help stay more informed with what is happening in Congress surrounding caregiver support issues? How can we keep informed and get active? Absolutely, there are a bunch. Um, I would say ARP obviously is like the big guy that puts out a lot of policy and um, advocacy and research. Um, Caring Across Generations is an advocacy organization that's doing a lot of work right now. I think they're um, particularly in the home and community-based services space, but they advocate for um, they advocate for fam unpaid family caregivers as well. And they interestingly run a caregiving fellowship to in to help caregivers become better advocates in this space. Um, so they're really one to follow. Um, currently, there's a real movement. The, the movement toward paid leave is pro is provoking a lot of social media um, 
just activity. So um, paid leave for all is an account that I know is tweeting a lot about that, um, that effort. Um, I know I'm going to leave some, I know I'm going to leave out good ones and then regret it. Um, but, you know, if you search hashtags like caregiving, you know, hashtag care, caregiving, hashtag paid leave for all, you'll find like a real intersection of advocates and um, policy organizations that are that are working in this space. And there really is so much out there. There's also a lot, though I'm speaking kind of broadly to the national space, but, and Christy, you and Patty could probably speak more directly to this in Oklahoma, which is not a, you know, a landscape I know well, but there are also lots of policy advocates and organizations within state by state because states are also really fertile ground for, you know, adding better, better caregiving support policies. I know here in California, there's, there's change kind of on the table um, and every state is different in what they, you know, what they're considering, but check with, check with state-based organizations as well to see, you know, what's on, what's on the docket. Well, thank you for providing that list and giving us some suggestions. And I think that that would be a great thing for us to put in our uh, follow-up email to all participants in ways that they can uh, stay informed and stay active. Um, well, that's all of the questions that we have. We got through them all. Thanks for those of you who stuck with us. And Patty, I'm going to pass it off to you uh, for the final note on this event. Okay. I think I'm, I'm unmuted. I forget sometimes. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone again, and thank you to all of our sponsors and partners. Um, we, you, we couldn't do this without you, and um, we thank you so much both for tuning in and for sponsoring and for making this possible, this evening possible. And yes, if um, certainly you need more um, information, we will find a way, Christy, to post um, local, uh, caregiver information, um, and we'll all do it together. I, you know, I, I, I think the landscape is already changing. We're even seeing in current legislation, right, Kate, you know, I think the American Rescue Plan already has some provisions, um, including some of the things you talked about, like um, increased pay for um, people on the front lines. So, uh, and certainly healthcare and people on the front lines of caregiving. So I think that those are uh, really good starts and, and those things don't happen when we don't use our voices. So please, please talk to your legislators, please use your voice. That is the most important gift that we have um, for each other and for our community. And that's what's gonna create change. So thank you again for being here. Um, and Christy, any final thoughts? Uh, just thanks to Kate, thanks for raising this issue. and. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there, again, there are a lot of issues with caregiving that a little self-care is not, are not going to fix. And we're just glad to start that dialogue. So thanks everybody for joining us. And thanks for supporting Hospice of Green Country Education events. And uh, since you registered for this one, we'll hit you up when the next one is coming around. Uh, thank you, Kate, so much for your time. We appreciate you. Thank you, Patty, for uh, the introduction and for moderating this. Thanks to Magic City for hosting us all of our partners along the way. I don't want to miss anybody, so I'm not going to list. Have a great <laughs> evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Kate.